welcome to Today in Woburn. I'm your host, Samantha Stone. We are going to dive deep on a whole lot of community questions that have come in about the reopening of our schools. We're going to showcase an amazing woman in our community and her career and her business at Paul Kenneth Salon. And of course, we're going to talk city business with Mayor Scott Galvin. So jam-packed show, lots of busy, business busy, here. Busy, busy, busy. Right? It's yeah. a lot going on in our city. I'm... Um, I'm feeling particularly energized, which is dangerous, Scott. You know me. I'm a little high energy to start with. And when you start putting sunshine and warmer weather yeah. together, um, I, I get full of ideas, um, which is which could be dangerous. But um, I do want to talk about a few things. Um, there was some question in the community around um, the flag in the center being at half staff or not. I know that there's a vigil being planned potentially for Friday. I don't know if the details have been... Um, settled down, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that and what we want to do to support our, you know, Asian um, descendants and ancestors and Asian community and yep. make sure everybody feels safe and welcomed here in Auburn. Yeah, that's the most important thing, what you just said, that we want everybody um, in the city to feel safe, welcome, uh, not threatened. Uh, and, and, you know, there had, there's been a lot of talk about um, increased violence against, um, you know, the, the, um, Asian population, which is unacceptable. It's unacceptable for, for um, harassment of anybody. But, you know, in, in this case, you know, we're talking about an incident that, were, that touched off, uh, that under, underscored basically what's been happening and, and uh, you know, tragic accident and a tragic incident. And, um, you know, uh, like I said, the main message from the city is that we, you know, we support all, all people. And, uh, you know, it's clear that uh, we want if anybody's had any instance of being uh, discriminated against, harassed, or any of that um, uh, ethnic violence against anybody, we want them to be able to come to City Hall, uh, come to my office, go to the police department or whatever, and make sure they report it because there's there's no place for that in the city of Woburn or in any community. And uh, you know, I, I did get an email from you. the The flag is uh, at half staff until um, d uh, dusk tonight. George Poole put that down on Saturday. Uh, and it is. Uh, um... Yeah, you know, it's a it's a tragic reminder um, to us, I think, what happened. We're lucky that it didn't, you know, the shooting didn't happen here, but it did bring up a lot of things. And, and I've heard lots of individual stories from people who are sharing their own tales of harassment and things and and um, comments. And um, it's unfortunate. And I think it's made us face that. But once again, I l love to see that we as a community are coming together. I know that there's a couple of groups who are looking to potentially sponsor a, an outdoor um, vigil, um, the details of which I understand are still being planned, that the flag has been um, brought down. And so, yeah. you know, thank you for that, that's reminding quite, us that. You know, um, President Biden wants it down until dust tonight. So as I said, George Poole will be out, but David Crowley, I think all, everybody knows that your viewers know Dave Crowley. He's a, uh, you know, does a lot in the community with SCI and he's spearheading uh, a vigil uh, for Friday. He reached out to me this morning and, uh, you know, certainly with the uh, increased gathering limits now, we can, we can, I told him we'd be happy to, uh, um, to, to allow it to be held on, on the common. We'll have uh, police presence there to help people get across the street from parking safely. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, we're um, very supportive of the efforts. And, and again, like we, you and I have said, the message is clear that there's no room for harassment of anybody uh, in our community. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you for reinforcing that. I'm sure there's lots of folks in the community be um, happy to hear that. We do have some other things um, going on I wanted to talk with you about. So Ward 7 city councilor position is open, as we know. Um, I just pulled down the dates. I'm just going to look at this to get this right. And I want to make sure that the there's a deadline for people to submit. I think it's the 25th, if I got that correct. Yes. For those who want to um, yeah. be. And so there there's an application form they're filling out. Is that correct? That is correct. So they're, they're uh, you know, the, the the city council actually, and just to be clear, so people know, the mayor has nothing to do with the uh, the appointment of um, the replacement of Ward Seven. That's by charter, it's, and it's happened a couple times. Uh, most recently with uh, the Ward Four position, it's solely um, a function of the city council. They'll make the appointment, uh, and they'll take resumes, they'll do interviews, and then they'll select uh, the. Alderman, and then again, there'll be another there's a race. So whoever gets appointed, they'll be pulling their papers probably in May, and um, the race will be in on for November. 
Right. Well, this is a great opportunity for someone to get um, engaged. And it is. It's and a good opportunity. It's it's a lot of work. We're not going to pretend. Otherwise, no. the city councilors will know that. But important work. So we're we're yeah. grateful for those. So excellent. Um, let's talk a little bit about other um, appointees where you're more directly involved. Yes. And this is a library trustees. So we've talked about it in the past yeah. with the resignations we have. Um, we don't have a quorum to be able to meet and do some of the budgeting yeah. diligence and things. Where are we at in terms of uh, signing at least one more trustee? So one, one of the things that there are a number of issues that are going on um, with the library and, and uh, it may be, um, you know, I'm working on getting another trustee, which probably won't be till, you know, with, with the way the uh, city council meetings run uh, and, and you know, with the time to interview, there probably won't be another trustee on until sometime in May. Okay. So, you know, we're looking at other options on how to have meetings uh, in the interim uh, to ensure a quorum and, and take care of some of the, the immediate uh, necessary um, items that need to be addressed. But, you know, quite honestly, as, as far as the operation of the library, a lot of, you know, and you know, a lot of good things are happening over at the library. Uh, we brought in an interim director uh, who will be there till. July 1st. Hopefully that's all we need him, but he's very good. Uh, also recently, uh, Hermaine Gordon, who's uh, been a library employee for a while, uh, was elevated to the assistant director, which is Yay! really- Yay! I want to give a moment of clapping. Yeah. She's fabulous. I'm so excited to hear yeah, that. She's that's excellent. And she's uh, she's going to make a lot of, have a, a, a lot of positive impact down there. So those are uh, a couple of the important things. Uh, the other things that, that I know you've been hearing, uh, which are very important as well is uh, positions are going to be filled, and right now there's uh, uh, the final uh, description for the children's librarian and the teen librarian are being put together, and those will be those will be hired, you know, as soon as the you know as soon as the um, applications go out, those will be hired um, and filled. We've got a couple part-time positions that are going to be filled. So all the all the good things that I think uh, the public has been you know looking for are going to be taken care of. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, uh, we'll still look to get that fifth trustee on, but but good things are happening uh, despite okay. the, the quorum of a, uh, the trustees. And we know it's important to get the trustees up and running, but I think the most important thing is the library is uh, coming back to full speed with positions that, that are much needed and, and uh, uh, serve the public well. So those, those are the pauses I want to come away with is that the children's librarian, the teens librarian, a couple of part-time positions and and, uh, you know, most importantly, we've got uh, an assistant director who's been promoted from within, well-deserving. And, and those are really good messages that need to get out. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. Um, in terms of the fifth trustee, just um, you said that maybe you can have meetings without it. Is there does it require some kind of legislative action or is there, are there already things in the charter that allow there you are things in the so charter that? that will help to address that? Yeah. And we'll look at we'll look at those. I'll talk be discussing with the city solicitor on how we uh, implement that to, to get awesome. it going. But, but the, the goal really is to have a fifth trustee up by the, you know, sometime in May. Okay. Uh, approved Good. by the city council. And, and those folks who are interested will, at this point, can continue to reach out to you, I presume. And I know they, they there'll be a more formal process at some yeah, point. Yeah, they certainly can. And, but, I, you know, so we're, so we're clear, the, the, uh, there's the lifetime trustees, there's six of them. Right now, there's four open trustees, four mm -hmm. open lifetimes. Those will not be filled until um, until the legislation is approved, but we'll, we'll start the process of taking applications Great. Um, sometime in May for those as well. And people can certainly reach out to me and talk to me about you know what we're expecting for those, but those will not be filled. Uh, we'll get to the fifth trustee and then they'll have a quorum, but the the new ones will going to wait. For the uh, legislation to pass. Good, and that makes sense. And so those, uh, you know, just to help people following along, um, the legislation that we're trying to put in place is to limit lifetime appointments because there's a whole bunch of things that come along with doing that. And so um, to give that time to not put somebody in that position and then potentially remove that yeah. um, makes it, there is an open position that is not a lifetime position. That's the one that Scott's talking about filling and then um, letting the legislation work its way through. So that's uh, perfect. Thank you for the update. Couple other little things, Scott. Um, so um, just housekeeping thumbs. Woburn Rec announced a citywide yard sale, which I don't think, uh, which I know is strangely an amazing community activity. There's so many people who get involved in our citywide yard sale every year. Yeah. I'm always amazed. And that's coming up on May um, 15th, I believe. I'm just looking yeah. to, 
Yep. Um, so for those folks who are interested that have had some questions, go onto the Woburn Rec site. There's a form you can fill out to get yourself listed there so that- Yep, one year hiatus, they'll be back. And that, that's a good nice. sign. That's another sign that we're coming out and getting, you know, moving forward. So that's- a Well, if thing. everybody's house is like mine, we, it's time to clean. And I've got a lot of stuff to push out. Um, and then we also have our first yard waste pickup coming up April 12th and 16th for those yeah. who use that. And then, then and while we're talking about uh, waste and recycling, we have the shredded, uh, the annual shredded where people can come to City Hall. That's April 24th, okay. 9 to 1. We do that twice a year. So that'll be um, Saturday, April 24th. <clears throat> uh, people mark their calendars. Right. It's a good one too. Awesome. I love it. Anything else, Scott, going on that we want to get people up on? I think we talked about the big stuff I had on my list. Those, those are the big items. Again, just uh, we continue to offer testing for um, city employees, teachers, <clears throat> residents every Friday at the high school, two to five. Uh, the numbers were just we had about 190 people test, no positive. So everybody who tested was negative. That's Matt will tell you that's a good sign. And, uh, you know, it's a good it's a good um you know, opportunity for people. It's a good service for people. It doesn't cost anything. You get your results back, you know, within 24 hours. So, uh, you know, we encourage people who want to get tested. Uh, it's at the high school and we'll continue doing that. Uh, Matt and I have agreed we're going to continue doing that through the month of April at, at, at least. And uh, we'll reconsider on May 1st if we, uh, if the demand is there to continue doing it. I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, I was thinking through school vacation weeks and, and typical spring breaks that people maybe go away and, and such. So keeping that testing in there through April makes a lot of sense. And it seems like uh, Jay Corey and Matt Barrett from the engineering department will come on and talk about stormwater with yeah. you next week. That's yeah, you know, I'm going to have to do a little homework to prepare for that interview, yeah. Scott. I don't know that I know enough about stormwater. Oh, you'll to handle, ask you'll handle them well. Yep, you'll do well. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to get my stormwater on this uh, this weekend. Thank you so much, Scott. We'll talk Thank again you. soon. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to listen in. I'm just going to turn my camera off. Yeah, of course. Please Thanks. do. Excellent. Well, Kat Merritt, thank you so much for joining me from Paul Kenna Salon. Hello. I'm excited. So um, I am um, the worst spokesperson for Kat ever because I'm lazy and I don't take care of my hair and do my hair very well. But if you saw it, what it was like without Kat's help, you would know what a big difference she makes. Um, Kat is my personal stylist, but also um, just an amazing woman in our community. And I'm so thrilled to have you on board and talk a little bit about your career. Thank you. So let's first start with um, the services business and salons in general had to change a lot about how you operate this last um, few months through the pandemic. I personally have always felt very safe in the salon. You've done some things to accommodate me personally that I appreciate, but also you've had to change your schedules and you can't have people like waiting and overlapping appointments and all kinds of things. Tell us a little bit about what you've done to keep people safe, but also how that's affected the business. So we've always had um, a lot of cleaning procedures in place in the salon in general, but we've definitely had to add some more due to COVID. Um, from a stylist perspective, I'd say maybe the service timing is a little bit longer because we're wiping down everything after someone touches something, after someone sits somewhere, we're wiping it down. We're also wearing um, protective smocks over our clothing um, and we're changing each smock per person. So that can add some time to the service as well. Of course, we're wearing our masks the whole time. Um, from a company perspective, as you mentioned, the whole booking of appointment thing, I'm so used to being slammed with like sometimes even up to four people at once. And now, you know, we started, we can only have one person at a time. We are really blessed with the space that we have. We have a huge space and not all salons have that. So we've been really able to honor the six feet social distance. Um, from a client perspective, all I've really heard is gratitude because they've noticed all the extra cleaning and stuff. It's a little bit annoying having to do screening questions before you can start. Um, but as you mentioned, you know, there's no waiting um, in the waiting area. All those chairs get wiped down. We're spraying down the hangers with Lysol before you hang your jacket. So there's a lot of extra things that may seem like it won't add time to the service. But I think that's the biggest thing, along with trying to schedule people's appointments. Um, I was curious where you have come in since COVID, you know, you have a personal experience with all the extra cleaning and stuff and how you felt during your experience at the salon. 
Yeah, you know, poor cat will tell you, I was a nervous wreck. I actually didn't have my hair done for many months. I kind of stayed home and just said, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I have a, you know, I think some of the people who've watched the show know I have some risk areas medically. And so I've been particularly cautious and I was really nervous, but I was also like done with it, the roots. Like I was like done. I can't take the white, you know, growing it anymore. And I just needed to do something. And I talked to Kat on the phone and Kat stepped me through all the things that they were doing. And I sent my 18 year old first to get their hair cut. And they came home and tell me everything was fine. And I sent my child seems wrong. But, um, but one of the things that has been really important to me is actually, and I appreciate is you've actually taken an extra step that is not required for me personally, and that I don't feel comfortable being around at hair dryers and and air circulating around. And so I've asked for my services to all be done in the, the color room so that there is, even though it's, I wouldn't have gotten it anyways, there's nobody around me having their air. Now I realize that that is an extra precaution. It is not necessary. It is part of my own anxiety, but you've been um, very accommodating to my mania and I'm uh, deeply appreciated. And most of all, she doesn't make me feel crazy for it. So <laughs> Um, and I really appreciate that the salon has, you know, has accommodated that and, and made that so that I do feel comfortable continuing to get serviced, um, even during these challenging times. You're not manic. We will keep <laughs> I, I've been coming in on Mondays and literally just doing solo appointments. So we really want to make sure that you as the guest feel comfortable. It's not about us as a, as a stylist or as a team. It's about what you feel comfortable with, especially in this COVID Time, you know, if there are people not even going out to a restaurant, what makes me think that you'd be comfortable with something publicly, you know, so yeah, well, we I really appreciate it personally, I and I have definitely experienced it myself. And I'm not getting my hair done as frequently as I might otherwise, because I'm not going anywhere. Um, but Kat was generous enough to put some purple in the other day. It's not there anymore, because I, I it's worn out. But I was, you know, I'm bored, and she accommodates my crazy and I and, and excitement, I really appreciate it. But also I'm still make it a welcoming and warm place. One of the things that um, I, I do, though, want to mention, Kat, is about you personally. So I won't say how many years I've been going to you because that's going to make me feel old. But Thank I've been you. I've been going to Kat for a, a, quite a number of years to have my hair done. And one of the things that I have always been impressed by is that at, very frequently you are telling me at a class you're taking or an event you're going to or a course you're running or, you know, a student that you're mentoring in the salon and I'm so impressed with how you take an always learning approach to your job and your profession, even though you're highly skilled already. Tell us a little bit about why you take the time to, to continue to invest in yourself and your, and your trade and your skill. Yeah, well, the more education I have behind me, not only does it make me more valuable as a stylist who you're going to choose from hundreds and thousands of other stylists all over the world, but um, it makes it so that I can make your experience and your hair the best that it can be always. There's always something new to learn. Um, you, it's so easy to just get stagnant if you're not. So if I go too long without going to a show or a class or even an online class, I get stagnant and that's not good for me or for you. Um, Cause if you get bored and I don't know anything new, well then we're both bored and then you're gonna leave me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can keep it up, you know? And not only has it been good monetarily, but it just is what keeps me inspired. I have such a huge passion for education and the salon does too. And that's really what drew me to it. The salon is super um, enthusiastic about education. We've been noted um, as one of the top 200 salons in the whole US since I've worked here, so for the past 13 years, um, and that's in regards to our education and training. So we really are prideful about how much time and energy we put into education, whether it's me going out to a Vidal Sassoon Academy, or we bring in an education um, manufacturer, an industry icon, and that way they can teach us new things and we can share it with each other. About like five or six years ago, I joined the Matrix Artistic um, education team. And so that's a little bit about me going out in New England and training other salon professionals. So for me, education is the biggest part of my career is what keeps me going. Well, I love it. And you also always, I always see someone or traditionally I've seen someone being in training, right? So you're also giving back and you're helping folks who are just starting in the industry to, to learn from you guys and, and get that practical hands-on experience. And so I'm, you know, gr I'm grateful for that. And there's always a smile and, 
and such, which is so great. Um, this is like a, this is a very competitive, we have amazing salons and so many stylists just right here in Woburn, let alone the surrounding community. What are some of the things that you've worked hard at in addition to obviously staying abreast of all the latest techniques and, and things to, um, as, a, as your own, you know, businesswoman, you know, building up your practice? Yeah, I think for me personally, I don't think stylists should be in competition with each other specifically stylists. We all have a common goal and that's creating beauty. That's making you feel good as a guest. It's not about our ego. Um, it's not about who has the most money, the most followers, who's the best at doing hair. It's about making you all feel good as a guest. So I just dive myself into the education because I know that will make me better. So I consider myself my own competition, but I really don't consider other salons competition. I want to go out and teach those salons. I want to build those stylists up. I want everyone to be successful. And whether they've worked here in the past, whether I've never met them before in my life, I think we all have the common goal and that's to make a difference in someone's life. And it's not a competition for me. I love that approach. And I think that um, sort of environment and spirit comes through and in, in interacting at the salon for sure. One other thing I want to just touch base, a lot of people have um, spent this last 10 months in our homes, hibernating, going out in bits and bobs, wearing masks, doing things we wouldn't normally do. And at some point, um, as spring comes, at least we're getting outside more. Hopefully, over time, as more people get vaccinated, we'll be able to do more things. Many of us are going to want a change. And um, so for those of your clients who want to change, whether it's color or style or whatever, um, maybe it's just a particular updo that day, what advice do you give people who want to change, but maybe don't know exactly what they want? Sure. Um, I have a lot of people that want to change. And if anybody has seen me around, I'll usually have blue or pink or purple, some sort of crazy hair. This is very conservative for me. And a lot of people are nervous that I'm not okay because I haven't changed my hair. <laughs> But for me, I'm always down for a change, but it has to be right for you regardless. So um, it can't be for a great before and after photo so I can put it on my Instagram and then you have hair that doesn't look good in two weeks, you know? So even if someone's like, what would you do if you could do anything in the world to my hair? You could chop it, this, that. I'd still ask the same key questions to those people because there's no point if you're not going to come in to maintain the color, if, you know, if you don't want to spend that much on your new maintenance for this um, color change, you know, then I'm not doing my job fully. I should be advising you, you know, are you going to want to come in this soon? Are you going to want to spend this much money each visit? So while I'm always down to do a change, whether it's as simple as a fringe or a huge color change, I still want to make sure it's right for you as an individual. So I could be as creative as I want to be in purple and this and that, but if it doesn't work for your lifestyle, then there's no point. So I still, even when someone is like, just do whatever you want, I'm still going to ask you questions to make sure it's going to make things for you. <laughs> well, I'm glad you do. And I think that's really important. I mean, one of the things is um, that I do really value and and how you approach things is making it a livable experience, right? So I can have a lot of different haircuts. And when I leave the salon and days when I do let you dry it, and I'll get back there someday, um, it looks really different than what it is at home, but it's a haircut that I could do nothing with and get by with, or can look really different when somebody spends a little bit more time. So thank you so much, Kat, for joining us. This is such a pleasure to get to um, showcase you because I've known you for so long, but, but also the good work you do. And um, we all deserve a little bit of pampering now and then. And I appreciate you coming in, talking us into making sure we're not scared about it. So appreciate sure. that. More than welcome. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, we now we're going to switch gears completely. And we're going to talk to two men, Matt Crowley and Rob Nickerson, who maybe hair isn't what they spend a lot of their time on, but you know, they still can have important grooming needs. So welcome, gentlemen. Hi, oh, thank Matt, you. There we go. We got, we hear you now. Thanks. So uh, Matt Crowley has been a guest many times. So, you know, he's a superintendent of Woburn Public Schools, Rob Nickerson. And for those of you who might not be familiar, is the principal at the Malcolm White School. And I'm um, glad to have you both here. Um, we have um, so much happening in our schools right now. Um, that is really exciting, right? It's a, an, an incredible time to think you're going to have all those bodies back in buildings and the 
in the coming weeks. It's also probably terrifying to think you've got all those bodies coming back in buildings. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit, Matt, about how um, spacing works in the school system. So particularly, um, we are fitting, you know, a lot of people back into the school classroom, some of which have been VA, like, are most people coming back full time? Do we have a good percentage who are staying VA? Like, let's start there. <laughs> okay. Um, well, there's a lot of moving parts. I'll try to answer as much yeah. as I can. Yeah. Let me start just by giving a few dates, if I, if I could. Um, Please. So we, in Woburn, we're going to do a phased approach. So beginning on April 5th, Monday, April 5th, mm -hmm. elementary schools will be coming back to a full in-person. At the middle schools on April 5th, cohort A will be coming in Monday and Tuesday for a full day. On Wednesday, it'll be a remote day at the middle schools, as it currently is. And then on Thursday and Friday, cohort B would be coming in for a full day. And we're going to do that for the two weeks prior to April vacation, just at the middle schools, give them a little bit of a transitional period, and, uh, you know, allow it lunches, the kinks to get worked out at the, at the middle schools. And then on April 26th, the Monday right after April vacation is our plan to a, for a full uh, pre-K-12 in-person return. So that includes the high school at that point as well. And so- right. Obviously, to get to make that happen, I, I heard you had a variety of questions <laughs> about what that might look like. Um, we do, and I, I'm I'm glad that uh, uh, Rob Nickerson's on the call because April 5th with the elementaries at at the beginning of the this phased approach, it made sense to invite an elementary uh, principal on. What I can tell you is that every school is different, so not all schools are configured the same way, and so that what might be at the Malcolm White configuration will be different, for example, at the uh, Harold Wyman or the Alta Vesta. So um, that being said, there are a few standard measurements that we're going to abide by, which is the three feet uh, of social distancing. I think maybe you saw the CDC adjusted mm -hmm. their guidance over the weekend as well, that now it aligns, Massachusetts and the CDC align with the three feet social distancing. And that's, uh, seat edge to seat edge uh, of a desk. Uh, and so students will be wearing masks. They'll be facing the same direction. When, and so th there is an opportunity in the guidance for students to take have mask breaks to, to, to do some limited turn and talk. Uh, and then at lunch, there'll be a six foot distance uh, in the guidance. And so, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to, to make this happen. The Elementary uh, principals have been working collaboratively with each other to develop their plans as far as the headings and, and items to be thinking about, but each plan is, is somewhat different. And so uh, those have been uh, pushed out to the families um, by the schools directly and by myself as a district. So it's, it's an exciting time. And I think, you know, we're excited to welcome students back April 5th. I think the other question that you asked was the percent of students returning. So we did push out a survey at the end of last week, closed today at noon. Right now we have almost approximately 20% of our students in virtual academy. We anticipate that number to remain pretty steady. So we, most folks that are in the virtual academy are gonna opt to remain in the virtual academy. Uh, with very, very few exceptions. So there's not a lot of, um, not a lot of change. That survey just closed this afternoon okay. at noon. So I, I can't give you a, an exact number. We have people actually working on it right now because we need that information to begin planning uh, as soon as tomorrow. Let me ask you some questions. And I do understand you may have to say, I don't know yet, right? Because some of this might depend on staffing, but there are some, um, Assuming that the 20% roughly stays as you expect it to and you don't find some dramatically different number, um, VA students who are older 
Um, so maybe the high school students are in, in some cases, maybe middle school, are they allowed to participate in sports? If there's a prom, will they be allowed to attend? Or is, is choosing VA mean you, you can't have any physical interaction in the school buildings? No, they're part of the Wuben Public Schools and okay. can attend. Okay, so I, I assumed that was the case, but I don't like to make assumptions. So thank you yeah. for confir confirming that. Um, there are some um, services that are offered in VA today. For example, I think there's a, I, one parent was telling me about a monthly um, adjustment counselor meeting that happens for all the students in VA. They signaled that when they go back full-time into the buildings, they might not be able to continue to do that is the, are there other things like that that you anticipate maybe getting disrupted because the staffing needs in the in the building will be shifting? I, we're going to try to minimize any disruption. I think the virtual academy is going to try to. We've had actually really good, great feedback regarding the virtual academy, and so to the extent that we're not that we can keep it where it is, we're going to, we're going to do that. Um, the question about the adjustment counselors doing a monthly meeting. Um, I, I don't know that level of detail as I sit here right now and what their, uh, you know, sort of constraints will be. Um, but if it's a monthly meeting, you know, we're really only talking about one or two month, one or two meetings in that case. Uh, but, you know, I, I think we're going to continue to support all students, whether they're in person or in the virtual Academy, as well as we can, you know, to get uh, through this most challenging year. Excellent. Um, you're not off the hook. I'm going to come back to you, but I'm going to ask Rob some questions specifically yeah. about Malcolm White first. Um, talk to us a little bit about what um, lunch and and specials might look like. So in a class in the main classroom, it's pretty easy to picture desks looking forward at the main instructor. When I think about art or gym or um, music class, even when I'm, you know, singing or playing an instrument, how will that be held once all students are back full time? Sure. So it, different than people are accustomed to, I suppose, is the starting point there, right? So um, I'll try to take it a little bit piece by piece. And I'll start with lunch, because of course, that's what kids are doing every day. And that's uh, kind of at the forefront of most people's minds is kids will be unmasked at that point. So Matt pointed it out, and, and even in the phrasing of your question, I, I understand you're asking for Malcolm White specifically. So what I'm saying will be Malcolm White. Other schools do have different setups. Uh, in our school, we were pretty lucky in a lot of ways that the spacing allows for us to use our regular lunch tables. And with dividers, we can sit uh, four students at a table that traditionally is set up for eight because it's uh, an octagonal shape, like it's almost a circle at that point. So with um, some dividers that in our school, at least are gonna be made out of the same material that a lawn sign would be made out of. So, you know, if you were running for office and you had a lawn sign in front of your house, it's a corrugated plastic that um, will, you know, stand up to being cleaned multiple times a day. And then over the duration of the time that we're gonna to need to use them. Um, and at least again at the Malcolm White, and this is something I haven't put out to the students yet, but the staff is well aware of, uh, it's a 25 minute lunch block that is um, mated with a 25 minute recess block. So there's two seatings of lunch and there's alternating recess for each seating. I'm gonna start allowing the students out after about 10 minutes instead of the traditional 25 to allow for extra time for cleaning uh, and also just to, to keep the separation as much as possible. So I Yeah, I have to admit, Rob, I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, kindergarten, first graders, even older kids, fifth graders, um, having to sit when they finish their food <laughs> and staying within their dividers. And I'm thinking as a mother who raised four children um, and, and I can yell at them um, that you can't do in the school in the same way, boy, that would be tough. So one of the accommodations you're making is by letting kids get outside and, and yeah. run around sooner. Yeah. yeah, like I said, I haven't advertised that to the students yet, but that is, yeah. is gonna be an integral part. And for whatever it's worth, you know, I've got 300 of them at work and I've got three of them at home. So I, 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 I on myself. Um, but yeah, it, it's all about organization at that level. And, and um, quite frankly, it's about um, supervision. So making sure that we have enough lunch monitors is something that was, was in, in many ways the, the biggest concern of the um, elementary principals when the decision to go back in full um, was decided. So, um, 
we're we're well on our way, and hopefully we'll get all the way to having the staffing that we need to to cover these needs. Okay. So I, I think that that covers lunch relatively well. I think lunch is good. Let's talk about um, uh, things like music and gym and art and some of the other specials and enrichment opportunities that will that usually happen. Yep. So again, in uh, for all Woburn schools, all Woburn uh, elementary students, they will have their five specials, which is to say they'll have art. Um, phys ed and music each week. And in alternating weeks, in most cases, it's alternating weeks, they'll have either library or health. So they'll have the normal schedule uh, specials that they would normally have. And um, of course, now in person. And the in my school, speaking specifically to my school, in order to make sure that things are set up in a way that's conducive to safety under the circumstances that we're working, Health and library will be in what is currently a vacant classroom as opposed to in their normal spaces. Uh, and that will allow for easier cleanup, easier coming and going and, and all of those types of things that keep us safe. Um, art, we just determined the other day because normally they would sit at a large square table and it doesn't allow for appropriate spacing. And even if we were to use dividers like we're planning to use at lunch, then the sight lines would be so blurred or, or blocked that the, uh, the students wouldn't be able to see the teacher, the teacher wouldn't be able to see the students, they still wouldn't be uh, you know, spaced in a way that everyone was 100% comfortable with. And then after that, we have to worry about the cleaning issues. Um, so as far as art goes, we're going to put art on a cart and our, our teacher is gonna travel around. I think that's very clever, art on a cart, I like that. Every once in a while you get lucky. You know? <laughs> um, so art will travel. When it comes to um, phys ed, students, as they enter into the space, are going to, um, well, there's hand sanitizer everywhere in the building, but I lit literally spoke with our phys ed teacher today, and as they enter, they're going to have um, the ability to uh, use hand sanitizer. They're going to do what they do while they're in, in phys ed. On the way out, they're going to sanitize again, which I should point out is pretty much the only time of the day when... Uh, when their primary means of, of cleaning their hands will be hand sanitizer. Other than that, whenever they travel in or out of any space, they will have the opportunity to wash their hands, which you know, I, I believe is preferable across the board. Um, and as far as the equipment that's used while in class in phys ed, um, we've, I've, I've structured the schedule so that typically the specialist will alternate between a younger grade, K1-2, and an older grade, three, four, five. Um, which allows typically for them to use different equipment, providing more time for things to, to be cleaned and also simply just not to be touched. Um, so we've, we've kind of factored that into the schedule as well. And I think the only one I'm missing at this point is music. So in terms of using instruments, any wind instruments, that's just not something that's on the table for now. Um, string instruments, yes, but then we get back to the same cleaning concept that we were talking about with regard to phys ed. And, um, you know, singing to the, my understanding as of right now, and I think this is something that's still being evaluated, but certainly while within the music classroom, I don't believe that there's singing allowed as of right now, moving forward and as things continue to change and adapt as we've all become too accustomed to at this point, um, we'll see where that takes us. But that's, that's where we are for now, I believe. Okay. And for phys ed, um, our students will be masked the entire time or will there be some exercises where they won't be, they will now, be. As of now, and this is another part of the conversation I had today, as things are right now, students will wear masks throughout phys ed. Um, you know, I mean, obviously if somebody needs to go get a drink of water or something like that, yeah. of course, with appropriate spacing and so on. Uh, but students even outside are going to be expected to wear their masks through recess when they're being presumably physically active. So yes, during um, gym class, same thing, wearing them. Okay. Great. And um, buses, what's happening with buses are because there are, will be far more students on a bus than are currently in the hybrid schedule. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll give my understanding and, and, you know, Dr. Crowley, please feel free to jump in as you see fit. But my understanding is that the windows are to be opened um, whenever possible. And even on inclement weather days that they're supposed to be every other, and they're supposed to at least be cracked that, um, students are still going to be assigned seats on the bus, but that the bus is back to carrying whatever, whatever it says on the outside of the bus, for example, 71 seats. My understanding is that they're back to being able to carry all of the students that it, um, traditionally would hold. Okay. And, um, they will not touch each other, right? In the whole ride. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I can imagine that happening, right? Um, but that, that sounds good. I think um, uh, that's excellent. Thank you. I have a couple questions, Matt, I want to direct you, and then I'm going to come back to um, you, Rob, mix, mix it up a little bit here. One of the things that is um, a challenge is equity when you have um, VA students who have a certain amount of live instruction time, and even if it stays the same as now, the hours weren't dramatically different from what they were getting for live instruction physically in the schools. Going back five days a week, full days, there'll be a pretty big discrepancy between VA students' live instructor time and in-school live instructor time, presumably. So A, is that true? And, um, and you're shaking your head no. So I'm going to give you, let me just shut up and let you answer that. No, I, I don't believe that to be the case. Okay, so VA, so VA teachers will be teaching more hours in the new model than they are now? Yes. Uh, Rob, Rob's shaking his head. I think- you If I may, do. yes. Wednesdays have been extended in right. virtual academy. Okay. So, so when you say they've been extended, what do you mean? Um, I believe all- to two, to 2 p.m. every day. Yes. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, and so, a, so a, sig a portion, I won't use the word significant because that implies judgment. I don't mean to be judgment applied to it. Not all VA instruction is with a teacher in front of you. Some of it is, and some of it's independent work um, or watching a video or doing those kinds of things. Do you anticipate, v so there's a Wednesday extension. Are there other changes to the VA program that you expect now that all the other students are going back full time that VA families should know about? I don't, I don't think any significant changes at okay. this time. Okay. All right. Um, Matt, I know this is an impossible question for you to answer, so I'm not asking for an actual scientific number, but if you had a gut instinct, um, do we have a sense of what percentage of our teachers are going to be fully vaccinated at the various dates of going back to schools uh, next, you know, the fifth for the elementary? Uh, it's a, I saw, I appreciate the question. I, I don't have a, a good answer for you. I, I know that what I what I, I do want to say that it's really been a community effort. And maybe Rob can speak to this because I know some teachers are more savvy at getting on an app and trying to figure out how to how to schedule appointments. I know some families have been uh, trying to help teachers get appointments. And so I, I know that at some of the smaller elementary schools, I'm led to believe that. 100% of the teachers that wanted to get their first vaccine have, have been successful so far. District-wide, I, I don't know okay. the exact percentage. Okay, totally understand. I, I, I know we don't have a way of really knowing for certain. So thank you for giving us a sense of that. Um, going back full-time for students is, I, I think a lot of families at the elementary level at least are gonna sleep well. <laughs> At night, it's going to be a pretty big transition from the schedules that we've had and and routine. Um, what are some of the ways that families, particularly for the younger children, but really for all students, can help prepare their student for going back to something that probably doesn't feel normal anymore because they've been away from it for so long? Rob, I don't know if there's anything you want to, you know, you're guiding young families to to try and prepare. Sure, sure, and, and this is something in in. Um the town where I'm living now, my first grade daughter has just started back. Today is the second Monday of her, uh, you know, full-time return. So I'm experiencing it a little bit at home. And um, yes, she's sleeping a little bit better. And, and yes, she's um, perhaps, uh, you know, a, a little more emotional than she normally would be as well. So, um, you know, I, I hesitate to, to go too far into it, you know, and, and crossing and blurring the line between parenting and educating to whatever degree, but I would say, you know, having some conversations about, you know, there will be more kids and there'll be more opportunity to, to do some of the, um, the fun stuff that we've kind of missed out a little bit on for the past year now, really. Um, but to just kind of go with the flow and, and, you know, you get what you get and you don't get upset and all of those little phrases that we, we use with our little ones because they work, you know. Um, a lot of it is going to be that, you know, you're going from eight or 10 or 12 kids at a time in a classroom to that 16 or 20 or 24 in a classroom. And that does make a substantial difference in terms of how much attention you can get from the teacher. And, and some of the teachers have been saying little things like, you know, 
you, you can't just ask a question. You're going to have to select a student because you, you can't, you know, when eight kids answer a question all at once or, or five out of eight or whatever it might be, it's a lot different than when 20 out of 24 do. Um, so it's, it's interesting. The, the little things, the, the nuances of all of this, it, it's really, um, it's fascinating in a lot of ways, but I, I think just patience, you know, patience and a willingness to, to kind of go with the flow are the two things that I would focus on. Uh, those teachers and all the staff at the school, not just the teachers, are going to have a lot of patience, I have no doubt, especially those, those buses, I can imagine, are going to be uh, a little hectic uh, for a long time. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the, you know, sort of things that go around school. So sports, we've got spring sports going. We're actually continuing some fall sports now. Um, this might be, it's probably more applicable to sort of the high school um, level, Matt, but are, are spectators are allowed at sports at this point? Are we anticipating it looking very much like it has been in, a, in limited capacity? Uh, so the answer is they keep increasing the amount of spectators. Um, so right now, it's at a limited capacity, but I believe that by the spring it, it'll expand. And so I give a lot of credit as it relates to sports to the Middlesex League athletic directors and our athletic director, Jim Duran. They've been working uh, very, very hard collectively to come up with a plan that would work uh, for, for our student athletes and, and for families knowing that it's not ideal. Um, and, and actually the uh, public media center, because they've been streaming uh, so many of the events and allowing people access uh, in a way that, that they didn't have before. And so um, also being flexible as it relates to sports, and I'll be specific, this past week, I, I got a phone call that uh, Woburn High School football team was supposed to play Arlington, but Arlington had to cancel due to COVID. And so then we were, in theory, going to need to look for a game. For Saturday, um, and then it turned out that Melrose, their opponent, had to cancel. And so, again, because of the communication and the teamwork uh, within the Middlesex League, it worked out uh, that the our Woburn uh, football played Melrose on Saturday. And so, um, the outcome wasn't what we wanted. But, uh, <laughs> Maybe not our best game, but they, you know, they were out on the field. They right, were out but, on the field, but but they were playing. And so, but that's the kind of um, you know teamwork really that is going on to try to get the student athletes back out participating uh, in competing. I want to talk a little bit about high school and, and middle school too. Um, one of the places that can be very anxiety driving for students under the best of circumstances in the hallways, like transitioning between classes, many people will try and follow protocol, some won't. I imagine there'll be a number of students who are anxious about it, who are not comfortable, you know, even if their peers are okay, kind of bumping into each other, they're, they're feeling uncomfortable with that. What are some of the things that are resources that are available for those students if they're feeling overwhelmed as they get back to school and get back to their routine? Yeah, sure. Well, a, a few specific ones. I know um, that the, at the high school, for example, there's going to be a, a morning check-in, um, a non-academic check-in. So anyone that is feeling an anxious in any way has an adult to uh, articulate that anxiety to. The plans, both at the middle and high school, there's no lockers, so just to, uh, to be clear. So Thank students you. aren't gonna be congregating at the lockers as they normally would. A lot of the hallways are one-way hallways, stairways, the same thing. So, you know, it, it, for those, kids that have been in the buildings previous, it's going to look and feel differently than it did. The other, uh, the other part to, to keep in mind is that um, the, our adjustment counselors, our guidance counselors, Rosemary Donovan, uh, who's the, the head of our uh, K-12 guidance department, has been working uh, to your earlier question that Rob answered um, about anxiety for students coming back. Um, the counselors are putting together a series of videos that will be shown to some of our students uh, to kind of diffuse some of the anxiety. They've been working hard because the social emotional component of this is, is a real thing. And so um, we're trying to be cognizant of, of that as well. And the other, I mean, all, you know, respectfully, the staff um, 
everyone's going to be really tired coming back to a full in-person, uh, what, it, you know, what it looks and feels like, it, you know, April 5th is going to be like the first day of school all over again. And April 26th will be that same thing all over again. And so it takes time to acclimate to that and get used to the, the day-to-day uh, reality. So, uh, we, you know, we want to try to support all students, but all staff as we head back into this transition. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, monitoring over time. So one of the realities, hopefully, at some point, all staff will be vaccinated who choose to or don't have a reason, you know, medical reason why they can't. Um, so hopefully most of them will be students, probably not this year, you know, except for maybe some of the older high school students, but certainly at the elementary level, they won't likely have a vaccine approved to give them. How will you be monitoring the classrooms to keep those students safe and to make sure that we're not seeing um, changes in, in spread and, and containment? And I, you know, I know at some point we want to stop having to do that, but probably not for most of this rest of the school year, if at all. So tell us what our, our plans are there. Um, well, I think a lot of it is just building on what we know already relative to contact tracing. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're going to keep to the six foot contact tracing uh, radius. Mm -hmm. So uh, our nurses are very familiar with that protocol and and we'll continue to do that. We have adopted the Abbott Binex uh, rapid test uh, that is available at every school for for any student or uh, adult who opts in uh, to be tested at school who are presenting any symptoms. We ask that uh, families and, and they've been great so far. Um, if if you're not if your child is not feeling well, please don't send them to school. Uh, you know you're not. Um, it, it, we're not um, going to hold it against you, uh, and we'd rather be uh, conservative as it relates to sending a a, a child with sniffles to school. Uh, you know as we might do in ordinary times. Uh, and then the mayor alluded to it earlier. We're going to continue the testing on Fridays through till May 1st. And that's for any staff member and any resident. So that would include kids uh, that that would wanna be tested on Friday afternoons. Great, thank you for that. Um, A couple of logistic things. So we have, um, we have been serving meals to families sort of regardless of um, need. Everybody can grab a lunch and go. Will that continue? as we return full time, and I assume VA students who are picking up lunches will be able to continue doing that as well? Uh, Yes, all of that will continue. That also does include breakfast. And so that will be free uh, for the balance of this year and also throughout the summer. So we will be able to provide uh, free food to all of our families uh, through the summer. That's wonderful. I I love to see that. That's really great. I want to, I'm just looking through, I want to, we've talked a lot about some of the challenges and the things that can, you know, getting students ready and classrooms ready and staff ready and and overwhelming and and all of that, but there's goodness in bringing students back. Um, Rob, I want to start with you. Tell us a little bit about what you're excited about um, getting those bodies back in that building. Uh, Yeah, I mean, there it is right there, right? It's going to be great to see all the kids at the same time. And while, of course, it's not going to be what we envision as normal, it's it's going to be our new normal, and we're going to work out some of those kinks. And it's just going to be fun to to have everybody together and and be able to enjoy it in something closer to what we uh, have been become accustomed to. So I I very excited, and the staff at the Malcolm White is very excited about um, you know just hearing 150 kids running around playing outside at the same time is, is fantastic. And, and it's crazy and it's chaotic uh, too, but you know, it's, it's why we do it. And it's, and it's great. And we're all very excited about having them back. I love it. We need that happy noise in our lives, right? That's awesome. Matt, anything that you'd like to add? No, I think Rob said it, said it well, the, uh, the, I, I, I want to see high school kids running around having fun outside too. Right. Because you know, that I, just to have uh, students back uh, where they belong, which is in school safely. And, uh, you know, it's exciting to be able to get to this point. It's been a very long uh, 12 or 13 months at this point for everybody. 
And, uh, you know, it, it's nice to kind of think about getting back to what we do best, which is to educate our kids in school. Yeah, I'm so excited for all that. Um, I have one last impossible question for you to, to answer, Matt, but I'm going to ask it anyways. I want to, in the off chance, you, you have some insight into it. Um, throughout the end of this year, families will have the option, of course, to do a virtual academy type of program. As we look at the fall, um, mm -hmm. do you anticipate having um, that program continue either as a result of COVID um, concerns and risks still, or just as a general availability of a program for students who maybe are not able to be in the building for a variety of reasons that, that pop up? Or do you anticipate that option not being available? Um, I, I'm going to answer to the best that I can. I, I'm led to believe that uh, we, this DESE will not require us to have that option in the fall. And so that being said, it's, um, it's probably not something that we would continue. Okay. Uh, you know, there, there's a significant expense to running a virtual academy as well as a full in-person. And so I'm not sure the budget necessarily would, would allow for that. Mm -hmm. uh, that being, you know, we, things, things have changed all the time for the past 12, 12 months. And so I say that. I, and I, I said it earlier on the on this meeting, I, we've done a great job, I believe, with the virtual academy. And, and so it, it's not something that, uh, you know, is we're, we're, we've committed to it. And so I think we've, we've done it well. And if, if we need to do it again, or uh, we will, and we'll do it well again. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think there's a lot of infrastructure that got built around virtual academy, but also just even hybrid hybrid model. And while we might not have, you know, a dedicated schedule like that, it does give us some opportunity to interact with students outside the, the building time in terms of homework or projects, right? Teamwork on projects and other things. Do you anticipate any of that infrastructure being leveraged in some of the day-to-day -day classroom work uh, next year? Or is that kind of a, a one-time sunk cost? Um, I, I don't know specifically how I'm trying to answer your question. I do think that there's silver linings to this. I think the, the technological skills that our students and staff have, have learned over the past year, if we go back and keep doing what we were doing before the pandemic and not leverage a lot of what we've learned, shame on us, right? So, you know, how it looks next year, I think, you know, there might be an opportunity to do a second grade project district-wide so kids from different schools could- get together on a project that, you know, using technology that they now know how to use um, and this, and the teachers know how to use it. And so I, the idea of collaboration in, in a digital world uh, has only expanded because of COVID. And so, I, again, I think with the silver linings of, of learning the technology, the opportunity for cross collaboration or inter-district collaboration even, you know, working with other districts on projects. I, I alluded to the Middlesex League for the athletics, but we've been on, I've been on multiple calls with the superintendents from other districts. And if there's ways that we can work collaboratively to support each other, uh, we're going to try to continue uh, to do that. Well, I think that's the perfect answer, Matt. So uh, thank you for that. I think that's wonderful. And I do think there's an amazing opportunity for us to um, take some good away from what has been a really uh, amazing struggle for you. Thank you both for joining me and answering a whole bunch of questions. Um, before we sign off, I'd just like to ask each of you if there's anything else you want to add as students prepare um, to, to get back to things. Rob, anything that you'd like to add? I think we covered just about everything. I, I, um, I really hope that everybody you know, has the ability to take a moment and, and reflect back on where we've been so that we can better appreciate where we're going as we move forward. I think that that um, is really an important part of this. And, you know, we're, we're excited to get everybody back together and, and you know, do what we uh, all kind of intended to do when we got into this line of work. So it's, um, it's pretty exciting. Well, I love it. My kids were Malcolm White kids, so I'm partial to that school, although it had nothing to do with why you were chosen to join today. It did make me smile when I saw that. Matt, anything that you'd like to share? Anything else? Uh, well, I just I think when when uh, Rob was talking about the Malcolm White plan, for example, 
the specificity and the thoughtfulness is evident. And I think all of our schools are doing that. And it's a, it's a tribute not only to the principals, but there's building implementation teams that are working collaboratively, a team of teachers and nurses and everybody to try to problem solve. And so I, I'm not sure how it's being done in all the other districts, but in Woburn, I, I'm really uh, very, very proud of the, the teamwork that I think has allowed us to get to this point. And I think will allow us to return to school safely um, beginning on April 5th and then uh, again on the 26th. And so I'm genuinely grateful to be uh, in a city that supports each other in such difficult times. Uh, thank you for raising that. I think that's really important. You can definitely see the care. And and, and even with all the care, there'll be things we didn't anticipate and we'll learn along the way. And um, the good news is there's a lot of people who care, who are paying attention and will be modifying and, and adjusting as they go along. <clears throat> so um, thank you both so much. And as always, thank you for watching and Woburn continue to take good care of each other.